and rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Give ye heed to what we say. Jesus Christ is born today. Man and beast before him now. And he is in the manger now. Christ is born today. Hey, Christ is born today. Good morning, church. Welcome to Grace Baptist. I'm glad you're here to join and worship with us. Um, some announcements we have going on today. We have two more weeks, two more weeks to memorize Psalm 119-105. Anybody got it? Anybody want to be brave and try it? You want to try it, Melinda? Awesome. Your word is lamps to my feet and light into my path. Good job. So, we want to do that because, again, Psalm 119 says, how can someone keep his way pure? By guarding uh, it according to God's Word. And so, we want to treasure up God's Word in our hearts so that we might not sin against Him. Against him. Uh, tonight, we have our Christmas carol service at 6 p.m. Uh, we're going to have some uh, congregational singing, some reading and prayer, and some specials as well. So, if you are coming, please bring a plate, uh, a finger foods, or a dessert to share for the fellowship after. So that'll be at 6 o'clock. I'm looking forward to that. Also, uh, no Sunday school classes will be uh, the coming Sunday, as well as just talk to all the other Sunday school teachers, not in your bulletin, but for the next two weeks. So December 26th or January 2nd, uh, there will be no Sunday school classes. So we'll just have the 1030 worship service uh, for the next two weeks. Also, so this week and next week will be the last two Sundays, pretty much, for the Lottie Moon uh, Christmas offering. Remember, all of that money, 100% of what you uh, offer, if you're offering there goes to support missionaries on the ground that doesn't cover any administrative costs for the International Mission Board or things like that. So if the Lord would lead you to, to give for that, please make sure you just write uh, on your check or your envelope, whatever there, uh, Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Also, on December 27th, uh, Caitlin Galdamez and Zephyr Foster's wedding. And so, uh, what time is that at, Caitlin? Six. I should ask Ryan there. That was the. Um, you'll be there. So, hopefully, Ryan will be there. He's doing the wedding. So, um, if you are coming to that, please make sure you RSVP at their wedding RSVP website on the knot.com, which should be there in your bulletin. Um, New Year's Eve chili cook-off will be on New Year's Eve, December 31st, uh, 6 p.m. So that way, if you guys want to be young rock stars and go do stuff late afterward, you can still come and enjoy fellowship here at the church. We're going to have a chili soup cook-off. Uh, and if you are not coming to, or if you're not cooking for the chili or soup cook-off, uh, please still come and either bring toppings for the chili uh, or, and or a side with uh, dessert. We're going to have games. We'll have newlywed games. So I haven't tapped a lot of you newlywed young people yet, but 
uh, you'll be getting a call from me this week and asking you guys to help out with that if you can. And then also just other fun and fellowship in the gym there. Guys, we still have room for the Ironman Summit, and so if you want to come to that, we've got a lot of guys showing up for that, and I'm really excited about that. If you are still planning on attending the Ironman Summit at the Bible Church of Owasso on February 5th, make sure you register online through their registration site, and also please sign up at the foyer here uh, so that we can know how many vans we need. Uh, youth group, we have uh, no youth on Wednesday, December 22nd, and also the same for college as well. And then youth will be meeting at the Schmitz House on Wednesday, December 29th. College, we won't be meeting there at the Schmitz House. So I guess you can crash that party if you want to. Uh, one other thing that is not in your bulletin, uh, we have a resource bookshelf there kind of by the foyer. A lot of great, awesome books for you guys to uh, check out at a very low cost for you as well, basically just covering the cost of the books. We're not trying to make any money off of that. Uh, some of them are very deep uh, doctrinal things. Others are, are much more digestible, kind of easy introductory things. If you're curious about the sovereignty of God or about um, parenting, there's a great little devotional there uh, for families to go through. And so lots of really, really good information. I would highly encourage you to check that out. There's a whole section just on Charles Spurgeon there. Really, really good stuff. So uh, I think that's all I have for us. And so uh, as the men come forward for the offering, uh, we will pray. We have guys who can help out come forward with the offering. Uh, God in heaven, we thank you, Lord, so much for this time that we have to gather together to worship you uh, with these songs, to worship you with our tithes and our offerings, and as we uh, have the privilege of hearing your word. Uh, God, would you uh, bless our time that we would uh, truly love you with our hearts, our souls, and our minds. God, you are worthy. Uh, would you be honored the way that you deserve? We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing as we rejoice of Christ coming down and taking on flesh. And, um, sing together as we sing, rejoice. Glory to God, for unto us a Savior is born. Jesus our King came down to earth, his people to free. Let the redeemed, let us sing Hosanna. Rejoice, rejoice, oh come let us adore him. Rejoice, rejoice. Let us adore Him, Jesus Christ, the Lord. Glory to God, for unto us a Savior is born, Jesus our King, came down to earth. His people are free. Let the redeemed let us sing Hosanna. Rejoice, rejoice. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Rejoice, rejoice.
joyful and triumphant, O come, O come to Bethlehem. Come and behold Him, born the King of angels. O come, let us adore Him. O come, let us adore Him.
evening for the reading of God's Word. I'm going to introduce Ryan's sermon by looking at Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. This is the Word of God. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is God's word. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word. Holy Spirit, would you speak through Ryan this morning? Would you speak into our hearts so that we would uh, have a bigger, uh, more faithful understanding of who you are, so that we can have a deeper love for you? Our lives would uh, live and be lived in such a way that it brings honor and glory to you in our homes, in our jobs, in our neighborhoods and the city, and to the ends of the earth, that you would be glorified. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. I don't know about you, but I, I love the Christmas season. I, I like the decorations, the lights, the, the get-togethers, the songs. I even love the, the crisp cool air. I love it this morning. You know, I woke up this morning early and was sitting by a wood-burning stove, and it's cold outside, and it's warm by that fire. And it's just, it's a, for me, it's a wonderful time of the year. And, and I understand that some people struggle this time of the year with, with loneliness or loss or various things. But this really can be the most wonderful time of year for many people. And for believers, it is especially significant now, some would argue that Christmas, you know, the birth of our Savior, we can celebrate that any time of the year, and, and that's true, but it, I think it's beneficial for us to take time to meditate upon the wonders of the incarnation, of God the Son taking on human flesh. This is something that we should celebrate together as the family of God. Last week, I had you shout out what you would praise God for that morning. And this morning, I want you to do the same thing, but I want you to shout out your favorite Christmas song. And listen, you don't have to try to be overly spiritual. And so as long as it's not last Christmas, just go ahead and shout it out. So that one, that one is of the devil, so don't, don't bring that in here. But go ahead, what's your, shout out, what's your favorite Christmas song? Oh, you guys are ready for that. All right, I love it. <laughs> Some good ones. I don't know if I heard any distinguishable, but that was great. All right. Listen, now, your favorite may not even be all that spiritual or all that theologically rich or, or biblically derived even. You know, maybe you like the song Jingle Bells, um, and that doesn't even mention Jesus one time it or even Christmas. In fact, it may not have been a Christmas song when it was originally composed. Some say that its origins were written for a Sunday school choir, but others say it was originally a drinking song that was written about the sleigh races that were taking place in Salem Street in Medford, Massachusetts in around the year 1850. Let me read some of the lyrics. And I think some of these you've heard and others you, you, you may have heard, and I'm sure that some have not heard these before. And so here they go, dashing through the snow in a one-horse open sleigh. Over the fields we go, I'm sorry, I'm not going to sing it. Over the fields we go, laughing all the way. Bells on bobtail ring, making spirits bright. What fun it is to ride and sing a slaying song tonight. Oh, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Now, we probably all heard that, but let me read the second stanza. A day or two ago, 
I thought I'd take a ride, and soon Miss Fanny Bright was seated by my side. The horse was lean and lank. Misfortune seemed his lot. He got into a drifted bank, and then we got upsot. Oh, jingle bells. Third stanza is this. A day or two ago, the story I must tell. I went out on the snow, and on my back I fell. A gent was riding by in a one-horse open sleigh. He laughed as there I sprawling lie, but quickly drove away. Ah, jingle bells. And then one more. All right, so the last one is this. Now the ground is white. Go it while you're young. Take the girls tonight and sing this slaying song. Just get a bobtailed bay, 240 as his speed. And everybody wondered, how in the world they get 240? Well, that was a, a mile in two minutes and 40 seconds, just in case you wonder. All right, so 240 as his speed. Hitch him to an open sleigh and crack, you'll take the lead. Oh, jingle bells. And so, you know, again, it may not even have been written at all as a Christmas song. And it's definitely not a biblical song, but it is just a fun enjoyable song that we can, we can bring to our lives to, to brighten up Christmas, just to have the joy of the season. And it's fine to sing it and enjoy that. So you've got songs like that. And then there are other songs around this time of the year that have much more depth of meaning and even teach the glorious truths that Christmas is all about. And we're going to consider one of those songs this morning. So we're going to work our way through a song, and we're going to look at the Scripture and the truths that this song points to. And that song is this. It's, What Child Is This? Okay, this was written in the 1800s by William C. Dix. And it strives to capture the wonder and the splendor of the incarnation. Dix, I guess, composed this after a, a near-fatal sickness that he had. And he was struggling with a deep depression. And his near-death experience, God used that to awaken him to his life in Christ. And I pray that this song of praise will fill our hearts this morning with the joy and the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ this Christmas season. So let's start with the song. So the first section of the song we'll put up here on the screen says this, What child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping, whom angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch are keeping? All right, so the song starts with a question. What child is this? Who, who is this child? that the angels greeted. Who is this child laying on Mary's lap? And so let's consider the scripture to which this song is pointing. And so let's look, start with Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. It says this, In the same region, there were some, some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. So the song asks the question, what child is this? And the answer we see in that text, he is Christ the Lord. Think about that term, Christ the Lord. Christ meaning Messiah or anointed one. This is the anointed one, the Lord, the king, who was born in the city of the king, the city of David. So this means this, this one is the king. This is the anointed king from God, the promised one born in the line of David. You might remember from our study in Samuel that God had promised David an eternal kingship for his line. Let me read 2 Samuel 7, 16. It says this, God is speaking to David. He said, your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So think about what the angel is saying there. He's announcing that this child, this is the king you've been waiting for. This is the king that God had promised. In our text, also the angel called him savior. That word means rescuer, deliverer. 
He is the Savior who is Christ the Lord. Again, amazing statements. I think sometimes we're so familiar with them that we, we don't stop to think about these things, which we're going to do as we work our way along. But picture the scene. I want you to, to just try to imagine what just took place in the Scripture we read. We've got the birth of this child with a multitude of the heavenly host praising God. So again, picture that. Here we are. We're out in, literally out in the fields. Dirt, grass, rocks. And we have these dirty, smelly shepherds. These are the unwanted. These are the unwelcomed. This is one of the most menial jobs that you can do at that time of life in, the, in, these, in that first century. This was, these were the unwanted that nobody wanted around them. Of, you know, polite society would shun them. So here they are. It's nighttime. They're sleepily keeping an eye on their flocks possibly sitting around a cooking fire. And then out of nowhere, a messenger of Almighty God appears before them. And it's not just two. It's not, the heavenly messenger is not alone. But the glory of the Lord, it says, shone around them. And I think we need to try to comprehend for a minute just how overwhelming this would have been. Let me well, think back with me to the book of Exodus and Moses goes up on the mountain, and he's, he's talking with God. And he asks God a question. He says, God, or at request, rather. He requests God, God, please show me your glory. And do you remember the Lord's response to him? He said, listen, I'll make all my goodness come before you. I'll proclaim before you my name, Yahweh. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show mercy upon whom I will show mercy. But listen to what God said. But... You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. That's the glory of God. Moses is saying, God, show me your glory. And God says, I can't do that. It would kill you. And then just think the next chapter over in Exodus 34. Moses goes up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, the law with God. And when he comes down from the mountain, it says this, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone. I looked up that word shone in the Hebrew, and it means to send out rays. And it was like, I almost picture somebody like being radioactive, you know, like the nuclear power plant, and their face is just glowing, and it's like these rays are shooting out from them. But they, all right, so Moses didn't know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and listen to this, and they were afraid to come near him. They were afraid of just Moses, who's just got the after effects of the glory of God. And so picture these poor shepherds now. A mighty angelic warrior appears before them, and the very radiant, shining glory of God is all around. It's no wonder that they were afraid. In fact, the Greek says this, that they were afraid with great fear. It's, it's phobeo, phobos, megas. Fear with great fear, massive. Phobeo, phobos, megas, where we get the word phobia. They were terrified, as they should have been. The glory of God is not something that you can take lightly if you get in the presence of it, if you're confronted with it. The full radiance of God is more than any human can handle. It's deadly. It would be more magnificent and more deadly than for us to try to launch a ship into our sun in the solar system. That's the glory of God. But again, notice in our text that it doesn't stop there with just the glory of God and one angel. But it says, and suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God. And so now what we have is an angelic army, an entire army of heavenly warriors. That word hosts means army. They were united here in praise to God. Can you imagine what that would have sounded like? I mean, it would be one thing for us to have a whole army of humans belting this out. But imagine the angelic warriors, the heavenly warriors from the throne of God coming down and just belting out, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. What would that have sounded like? So all of that is elicited because of this child being born. And so you got the question in our song, 
What child is this? It's a child asleep on a mother's lap. A child that evoked the worship of heavenly warriors and the shining radiance of the Lord God Almighty. Well, we read in the rest of our sing and the rest of our song, what we see from Scripture, he answers the question. So let's look at the next part of our song. It says this, This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing, Haste, haste to bring him laud, the babe, the son of Mary. Let's read some more scriptures. And Luke chapter 2 brings this up, verses 15 to 20. It says this, And it happened that when the angel, angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And when they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it marveled at the things that were told them by the shepherds. But Mary was treasuring all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as was told them. I think we could we can picture this happening, right? They've just been visited by these warriors of the heavenly kingdom. They've, uh, they've been told that the anointed Davidic king has been born. And, and remember what he said there, too, that this is a, a child born for you, for you, a Savior. He was their Savior. Not only that, but the child, it says, from the angel brought up, this is great news, or good news of great joy for all the people. And so what do they do? They rush Haste, haste. They rushed to this child to see the newborn king, and they find him just as the messenger had said, lying in the manger. And so, of course, what do they do? They tell Mary and Joseph, listen to what happened to us. Here's what we saw. Here's what we heard. Here's what the angels told us. This is the king. This is our savior. He is the one that we have been waiting for. So, again, picture those, those shepherds. They've just, they've rushed to this town. They're out of breath. They finally found them. They're in standing now in this stable. They're looking down into this manger, into a food trough. And there lies the son of God, a human baby, their king, their savior. This, this is Christ the king whom shepherds guard and angels sing, haste, haste to bring him laud, the babe, the son of Mary. All right, so the first stanza of our song poses the question, what child is this? And it answers it, this is Christ the King. Well, the second verse, I don't know if you recognize this, but it asks, asks another question now. And let's look at that question in the next couple of lines of our song. The question is this, why lies he in such mean a state where ox and lamb are feeding? Let's look at the scripture for that. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Luke 2, 1 through 7. So it says, Now it happened that in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus for a census to be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was going to be registered for the census, each to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee from the city of Nazareth to Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was betrothed to him and was with child. Now it happened that while they were there, the days were fulfilled for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the guest room. All right, let's step back for a minute. I want, to, I want you to think in your mind. Don't shout this one out. I want you to think, who's the first person that comes to mind when you think of the richest person in the world? So if you're thinking of like the richest people, who, who, don't, again, don't shout it out, but who comes to mind? I'm sure there's a lot of different thoughts that are hitting there. Maybe you thought of Donald Trump, okay? Now, Donald Trump, he's up there, but he's actually number 1,299 down the list on the Forbes richest persons of the world. His net worth um, is 
billion dollars. I know billion is hard to wrap your brain around, but I don't even know if this helps. But there are a thousand millions in a one billion. Okay? All right. You all got that now. No problem. $2.5 billion. All right. But he's, he's number 1,299. So let's jump up the list a little farther. Um, Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook. Uh, he is number five richest in the world at $97 billion. All right. And then we go up to number four, Bill Gates, Mr. Microsoft, number four richest at $124 billion. And then jump down, I, number three I didn't recognize, it was not somebody from the United States, but number uh, two I did was Elon Musk of Tesla and SpaceX. He is number two richest in the world, $151 billion net worth for this man. And then number one, and number one is actually the world's richest person fourth year in running. 2021 is the fourth year in running. Anybody, any guesses? There you go, Jeff Bezos, the Amazon founder, okay? $177 billion net worth for that man. So I want you to think of that list of people, okay? Could you picture any one of those people allowing their child to be born in a stable next to animals, dust, manure, and then laid in a food trough. Can you picture any one of those people doing it? Maybe we might dream of that happening, but would it ever actually happen? Would that actually take place? Would any of those people choose for that to take place? Well, not unless there was some mental instability there, which I'm not saying there's not or there is, but they wouldn't choose that. But yet, who are we talking about in our story? Who are we talking about? This child. This is the Messiah, the King. This is the Son of God. He is the King of every king that exists. He is the Savior of the world. I love how the book of Hebrews describes him. In Hebrews 1.3, it says this. Just listen. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. That's who we're talking about. Do you remember the account when uh, the angel Gabriel came to the young virgin Jewish girl named Mary? In fact, we'll put it up here on the screen. Luke 1, 30 to 33 says this. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And there will be no end of his kingdom. Again, think about that. That is the child that we're talking about. And so you understand the question in the song where it says, Why lies he in such mean a state where ox and lamb are feeding? What in the world is he doing in a stable in a food trough? Now, you might wonder what that mean estate, and I know most of you know what that means, but it doesn't mean he's mean, you know, he's, he's got this mad estate. But no, it's, it's mean, it means poor, shabby, inferior, worthy of little regard. That's where this child that we're talking about, that's where this child was born. That's where these shepherds find him. The people of the town of Bethlehem couldn't or wouldn't even make space for them in the, in the guest room of their house. I know we're used to thinking there was no room in the inn. There were no inns in Bethlehem. Bethlehem was like the podunk of podunk towns. I mean, it was little bitty, nothing there. There was no inn there. There was no palace. There was no crystal cathedral. Not even a guest room in a family home. The only place for them was the stable with the animals. There was no crib. No bassinet, 
only a dirty food trough to at least keep this child up off the ground. Why lies he in such mean a state where ox and lamb are feeding? Well, let's keep going with our song. I'll put the lyrics up here. It's, now it says this, Good Christian, fear, for sinners hear the silent word is pleading. Nails, spear shall pierce him through. The cross be born for me, for you. Hail, hail, the word made flesh, the babe, the son of Mary. All right, you recognize some of those lyrics? What, the word made flesh. We're, we've got the word, the message, uh, the message of God becoming a human being. Where do we find that in Scripture? John 1. Let's look at John 1, verses 1 through 5, as well as verse 14. John 1, 1 says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overtake it. And then we jump down to verse 14. We see very clearly who this word is. Verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. We have got I think this time of year especially, just to stop and consider the wonder of all of this. The eternal Son of God, the Word of God, God Himself took on flesh and blood. He became a human. He was born to a young virgin girl named Mary. That's who this child is. That's who was laid in the mean estate where ox and lamb are feeding but I think this now begs us a question that we have to ask about this is, why would God do this? Why would God do this? Why would God, the God of glory send his son, the king of glory, to become a human male infant? Well, another question. Let me back up to a different question for a moment. Why did Jesus come at all? Why did Jesus come to this earth? And there are a lot of answers that we could give from that. He came for the glory of God. He, he came to fulfill the plan of God. He came to be obedient to his Father. And those would be all true. But I want you to think for a moment, what are some of the things that Jesus said about himself, why he came to this earth? Let me read just a couple of them. They won't be on the screen, but I just want you to listen. In Luke 19.10, Jesus said this, The Son of Man, there he's referring back to a prophecy in Daniel of himself, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. Or think of John 10.10. 10. Here at the beginning, he's talking about the devil, and he says, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Or Mark 10.45, Jesus said this, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus said it so clearly, the whole purpose of him coming, he came to save lost sinners. You know what that means? It means he came for one purpose, to die. As the song says, nails, spear shall pierce him through, the cross be born for me, for you. You see, our sin earns us a death sentence. Our lust, our greed, our lies, our selfishness. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Only by death can our sins be paid for. And really what he's talking about in Romans is, is the eternal death. It's the eternal separation from the goodness of God in hell. It's to be eternally forsaken by God. That's, okay, think about that. That's what you and I have earned in our sin. That's the wages of our sin. This is what the scripture calls the second death. Okay, 
So keep thinking with me. What other death could possibly pay for the magnitude of our sins against God? How could we pay for that? In fact, it was interesting. I was reading this morning. I was praying through Psalm 49, and I saw these three verses. It says this, Truly, no man can ransom another or give to God the price for his life. For the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice that he should live on forever and never see the pit. What death could, could be enough to pay for? I, listen, I couldn't pay for any one of you because I'm sinful myself. It'd be the same thing for you. You couldn't pay it for me. Not only that, but how could one death cover a multitude who deserve death? What death could be sufficient for that? Well, listen, the death of God could be sufficient for that. The infinite almighty, if he were to die, that would be a big enough penalty to pay for everyone. But the problem is, God can't die. God cannot die. He is eternal. He's immortal. And so God did something shocking. God became a man. The eternal word of God took on flesh and blood. The almighty God limited himself and became a mere human being. He became like us. We've got the infinitely rich. Makes Jeff Bezos look like a pauper. He became nothing. Infinitely rich becomes poor. We've got the all-powerful. I mean, this one speaks and universes leap into existence. The all-powerful, and he becomes weak, literally a helpless babe in a manger. We've got the all-present spiritual being limiting himself, limiting himself to one physical flesh and blood location. He did all of that for one purpose, so that he could die as a man in the place of men. As the song says, the cross be born for me, for you. So think about that cross. Jesus went from the glories of heaven to a lowly manger, but he didn't quit descending there. He sunk even lower to public execution as a criminal. In the 21st century, we have lost the offense of the cross. In the first century, this was the, this was the F-bomb. You didn't say it. This wasn't something you spoke about at the dinner table for Thanksgiving with your grandma present. It was, it was a nasty word. You wouldn't say it in polite society. Only the worst dregs of humanity would be hung naked to die on a cross. In fact, even the Scripture calls it contemptible, doesn't it? Um, Paul in Galatians 3, he quotes from Deuteronomy, and he says, Cursed is anyone who is hanged on the tree. But he also says there that Jesus Christ became a curse for us. So the song asks, why does he lie in such mean a state? The answer is this, so that he could bear a cross for me, for you. That is the point of the incarnation, of the word made flesh. That's the point of the manger. He lowered himself. He became like us to bear a cross to save sinners just like us. If that doesn't cause us to burst out in praise like the song, Hail, hail, the Word made flesh, the babe, the son of Mary. Oh, I don't know what we'll do that then. So, so far the song has asked two questions and answered two questions. What child is this? And, and why does he lie in such mean a state? And now it calls for response in the last stanza. So let's look at that. The song says this. So bring him incense, gold, and myrrh. Come peasant, king, to own him. The king of kings salvation brings. Let loving hearts enthrone him. So the identity of this child and, and what he came to accomplish, you know what that is? That's a call to every person on this earth to come to him. We have the peasant shepherds, the low of the low. And we also know from the story that the magi came, these magi from the east, often referred to as kings. So who do we have coming to Jesus just as a small child? We have the low 
And we have the high. As the song says, come peasant, come king, to own him. Now that word own might be confusing a little bit to you. It doesn't mean own like he's my possession, but it's more the idea of kinship. It's like, you know, Shelly is my own wife. These are my own children. You all are my own family. Okay, it's that idea. It's, it's this kinship. It's his, and used in this way, the song acknowledges the truth that as believers, we're united to Jesus. We have an intimate family bond with God. Whether you are highborn or lowborn, the call is to come so that he would be your own. In fact, we find in Christ that, that there is a removal of the separation of people, of the statuses and the, and the hierarchies. In fact, we'll look at Galatians 3.28 real quickly. It says this on the screen. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Everyone come. The king of kings didn't come just to save kings or to save the elite. He came to save folks just like y'all, like us. But we see that in 1 Corinthians when Paul writes to them. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 29 up here says this, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Y'all, we're right in that section of Scripture. Come peasant. Come king. You single mom on welfare, come and bow. Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world, come get on your knees. The king of kings is here, and he is the only one who can save you. Come accept his offer of deliverance, and then in love, bow before his holy throne as a people forgiven and made new. Let's look at the last part of the song. It says this, Raise, raise the song on high, the virgin sings her lullaby. Joy, joy, for Christ is born, the babe, the son of Mary. Church, we were created to worship God, this magnificent being, and only in our King and Savior can we fulfill that purpose. Only in Jesus can we find the eternal joy that will lift our hearts to the throne room of the Almighty. Peasants, Kings, weak, strong, foolish, wise. The low and the despised kneel side by side with those powerfully and nobly born. The manger is a manger for all sinners because the cross is the cross for all sinners. And, and these truths that we're going over right now, these aren't things just to kind of coldly analyze. And let's, let's write a little nice little theological treatise and just kind of dissect all of this. This is the stuff of worship. This is the stuff of singing. Christmas is a time to say, to declare in the wonder and the awe of worship, what child is this? Let's pray. Father, thank you for giving us your word and allowing us to, to stop and, and even be reminded with this time of year to, to reflect upon the wonder of the incarnation. The Lord is crazy. I mean, truly, Lord, this is, this is a story that doesn't make any sense and, and it's foolishness to so many people. But for us, Lord, it is the message of your salvation. This is your love and your kindness. And this is the truth that we lay all of our hope on, that Jesus Christ came into this, into this world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. We need our Savior, our King. So, Lord, would you help us to lift high on songs of praise and in hearts that adore you, the Lord Jesus Christ. To trust in him alone, to look to you through him alone. May we worship together this Christmas season, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, 
and cry out with God's people, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And it's in that mighty, beautiful, powerful name that we pray. Amen. Well, we've read it, and we've heard it preached to us, so let's stand and sing it together. What child is this? What child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap and sleep? Whom angels greet with anthem sweet, while shepherds watch our keeping. This, this is Christ the King, who shepherds God and to close out with crown him with many crowns but pay attention to the lyrics because this is the christmas theme crown with many crowns so it's the same song just different lyrics there we go Oh, 
For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, for whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. And with that, you are sent.